We need to have these books back in place. We need it for the safety of our students. We need it for the safety of our parents. And this is not a conversation that we should be having. Battle of the books. People continue to show up because this fight is important every single day. The ban reversed. We can achieve human reproduction and disease education that is age appropriate. We'll set the example as the fourth largest school district in this great nation. It's been very difficult the last few days since last uh, week. I certainly have been disrespected. I've been threatened. A parting shot from a veteran. But you know what is part of the job? This job is not for the faint of heart. Just living day to day in this district is becoming increasingly difficult. The cell for schools. We are the largest employer in Broward County. We want our employees to be able to live and work and play in the same community. Will voters tax themselves? A Broward ballot mystery. Right away. I opened it and I knew that it was the wrong candidate. The answers straight from the top. The race for the county commission, a current mayor. Today, I ask for your support to bring my experience and transparency in government to Miami-Dade County. A former city commissioner forced to resign. The big news of the week, this week in South Florida. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. What a difference a week makes. That is how long it took for the Miami-Dade School Board to reverse its decision to remove a textbook about sex health education based on a number of objections from parents. But then another petition by public school parents garnered thousands of signatures in support of bringing back the book and the change of heart by the board chair brought back the book. This plays out in an election year where education policy and parental rights are at the center of Florida politics. Here with us today are Alex Serrano, executive director of County Citizens Defending Freedom. Last week, he presented 278 petitions to the school board objecting to the sex ed textbook called Comprehensive Health Skills. Gina Vinuesa is a PTS leader at Palmetto Palmetto Senior High and her group, Parents for Children in Miami, quickly collected some 2,500 signatures asking that the school board rescind, rescind the ban and reinstate the book, which in fact they did. So, Ms. Vinuesa and Mr. Serrano, welcome. We're glad to see you. Thank you for having us. Just wanted to point out that of because of COVID protocols, we stay separately and we're all on Zoom. And that comes with it some technical difficulties, which we're having with Alex Serrano right now. So we're going to get him back up on a, on a Zoom link. So Gina, let's start with you because that petition, boy, that was a petition that got thousands of signatures in 24 hours. Uh, how did that start? How did that come ab about right after the school board decided to take away that book? Thank you, Glenna, for asking. <clears throat> well, after can. last- Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I think we're listening to Alex. <laughs> Alex, is that you? Alex, we hear you, I think. I dropped off, I'm, I'm back. Okay, Good. great, all right. Good. So Gina, why don't we answer, yeah. um, let's talk about first how this all came about because we're gonna talk about Alex, is, his petition is the one that got that book banned. So Gina, how did, how did that all come about? So after the, the board um, ruling on July 20th, um, several of the parents that were there, myself included, um, continued the discussion about our concerns and the critical need for our students to have a curriculum in place before the beginning of the school year. We were contacted by several, several, several parents in Miami-Dade County Public Schools and felt the need to create this petition so that they would have a voice to let the school board know how concerned we were. Um, we asked specifically that they reconsider the previous decision and, um, and, and put this curriculum in place, which has been missing for two years in our school. Yeah. Alex Serrano, are you with us? If we can't, let's pop him up. There he is. Upper Thank right, you. Alex. Good morning. Glad to see you. Uh, it Thank is you for your, having me. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Um, it is your group, County Citizens Defending Freedom. We'll talk about that later, what it is, what it, its goals are. But you sure. presented on behalf of the group 278 petitions to the school board objecting to the use of this textbook. What were your objections? What was wrong with it? So let me clarify that, Michael. We, we didn't present petitions on behalf of CCDF. We presented or we facilitated a process for various community members and parents of the district 
to officially petition to object to content of these books and to object to the process that was executed to select, recommend, and adopt these books. I want to put context real quick between the two petitions. One petition, which is Gina's petition, is a change.org, which simply allows a user to click I agree or send or sign. And uh, I will argue that the, the pretenses of her petition are misleading and irresponsible, and we can get into why. Yeah. The so petition they, objections Alex, that we submitted or on behalf of parents and community members are under a statutory process, which required that these members review the material, uh, cite specific material that they objected to, fill out the form in handwriting, yeah. Alex, sign I'm it, gonna, and mail I'm it gonna interrupt you. I, we really don't want to get bogged down into process and whether process was formed. I mean, the fact of the matter is that you and your group object to this textbook. What is wrong with, uh, what parts of the textbook do you object to? First and foremost, we object to the process that resulted in the recommendation of these textbooks to the district. It was under a veiled fashion that did not enable and promote community and parental involvement. Secondly, we do object, and many community members that we facilitated their objections to object to several portions of the content in this book, mainly because they are not age appropriate, which is covered by statute, because they violate parental rights, which is also covered by Florida statute, and because they are not scientifically and, and biologically factual. So, Gina, I, w I would like you to address that. I mean, we don't want to get down, uh, bogged down in process, to Michael's point, but the schools do have a process by which parents can address things. Um, your petition was more of a reactionary petition. I say that with great respect. Um, because you, something happened that really you didn't want to happen and you got the tide turned. And I, I would like you to address Alex and the concerns of other parents like Alex. And, and I just want to go on record to say, Alex, your, your kids are in private school at the moment. You are not a public school parent. But, but we have new laws right now that, practically speaking, don't change much where it comes to parental rights in schools. Parents have always had rights in schools, but they certainly do enumerate them and specify them. And, and so take that, if you would, Gina, and, and what happens now going forward with these kind of processes and textbooks and curriculum? Thank you. I, I understand completely that parents have a hard time talking about this subject with their kids and that all kids develop differently. These textbooks provide all kinds of information essential to kids, the information that's required by Florida law. We're talking about information about how to identify abuse, consent, and why it's important in relationships, how to protect yourself against diseases which are climbing in our county, and also how to protect yourself against unwanted pregnancies. I think this information is factual. I think it has been vetted appropriately by experts. There was, in fact, parent representation on the panel, and, and I support fully parent involvement in the process of educating our children. And again, I understand all children develop differently, and each family has the right to decide what information their child is exposed to, or even how their family values influence those, those decisions about that information. And that's why Miami-Dade County Public Schools is a district of choice. That was never, ever threatened. Parents always have the opportunity to opt out of any curriculum that they don't agree with, whether we're talking about reproductive health or we're talking about geography. And, and listen, if we allow parents on this panel that are, are looking at geography books that don't believe that the earth is round, at, at what point do we... Um, stop listening to our experts and trusting our experts and our teachers on these subjects. Alex, I, I would love to hear your response to mm -hmm. that question. And also, uh, my sort of also question, parents do have the op opportunity to opt out of sex ed. There is parental choice. And so yeah. taking a book away might crash the choice of people who do want it. So those two questions, where does, where does fact and belief come to play and isn't opt out enough? So let me start with the opt out process. If it, one of the main primary claims that we have uh, in objection to the entire process that resulted in the recommendation and adoption of these books in the first place is that it did not enable sufficient community and parental involvement. We had to take it upon ourselves as an organization to inform our community of the content within these books. That would tell you that 
these opt-out forms, when they're received by parents, when they're mailed out to the parents of the district, that the majority of these parents would not have knowledge of what they are opting out of. If they don't review the books because the, the publication of the books and the access to them by them is not sufficiently noticed, then they have not reviewed the content and they are not opting out in an informed manner. So that is not conducive to informed consent. In terms of qualified experts on the panel and parent participation on the panel, I want to address that because there were nine uh, committee members that selected and recommended these books. The majority of them were PE teachers. We would argue that those are not qualified experts for uh, various medical procedures that are covered in the book. And in terms of parent participation, there was only one parent in this committee, and that parent was a district employee and teacher of the district. So 10% roughly of parent participation is insufficient. At the very least, it should be 50% uh, parents on these committees that review and select these books. All right. Well, we'll be wanting to hear from Gina on that issue, but everybody hold your places. We'll be back with more discussion about sex education and textbooks in Miami-Dade. We are back with Alex Serrano and Gina Vinuesa, two very engaged parents on the opposite sides of the sex ed textbook issue, talking about what happened this week. Uh, that book now back at Miami-Dade, in Miami-Dade classrooms. Um, Gina, Alex in our last segment was talking about how that opt-out was not appropriate and that how the panel who decided the textbook was appropriate just didn't have enough parents on it. And uh, I know you wanted to address that. Yes, I, I, I agree with Alex in the sense that I think parent engagement is vital to the education of our children. And I am beyond thrilled that this issue has allowed more parents to be aware of what's going on and to engage actively in this discussion. Um, the reality is, however, that our public schools serve children from all backgrounds, many of whom do not have trusted adults at home. So this is one of the many reasons why it's so important to support our public schools and our teachers and for the parents that are aware to engage in this discussion, because we all have a responsibility to all of our children, not just our own. Alex, uh, let me go back, uh, not to sound repetitive, but I still want you to respond to the objections specifically. Now, I understand that I've looked at the textbook in question. There is some kind of brief discussion of transgender, cisgender. It talks about uh, emergency uh, abortion uh, contraceptives. It talks about going to a trusted adult if a student has a problem. Uh, do you object to any of that? Yes, Michael. So let's start with the gender identity component of it. If these are health uh, and hu human reproduction and disease education textbooks, this is official instruction. So gender identity would fall under the realm of ideology that does not belong in these textbooks. If you are providing uh, scientifically factual and accurate gender information, it is that there are two genders, male and female. This ideology, if it belongs anywhere in the school district, some Many parents, most I would say, would argue that it doesn't belong in schools at all. It definitely does not belong in human reproduction and disease education official instruction. So what's interesting in listening to this and pretty much a year's worth of debate on these issues is there, there seems to be a line that no one crosses and it's either you believe in something that is ideology or you believe in something that is science. And that's a very yeah. difficult conversation to have to bridge because it is what it is on both sides. And, and just for the record, we respect everybody and all sides here. Um, so I, I wonder if you can weigh in because to your point, Alex, some of the law and some of the policies use words that are very vague and age appropriate may be one of them. Age appropriate for one family may yeah. not work for another family. So what, what do you think is age appropriate for middle and high school? What is that age or is there one? I think that in order to achieve that definition of age appropriateness, it, it requires sufficient and impactful parental and community involvement so that what is selected and recommended reflects the values of our community as a whole. And that is and why we argue that the panel was not appropriate 
in terms of expertise to, to recommend this content and to reflect the values of our community because it did not have sufficient community and parental involvement. And Gina, what, what in your opinion is age appropriate? Well, speaking as a, a mental health therapist um, who worked for over 10 years with children and families in the area of mental health, it, it, is, it is unique to each child and each family. But I will say that the, the topics that we're discussing here are appropriate for some children much younger than even middle school and high school. So it, it can't really be generalized in that way, which is why we do need parent involvement. However, the job of the school district is not to instill values. That's the framework our families and our communities provide. The job of the school is simply to provide support to all of our students and accurate information that's based on best practices and what we know of today. And again, as a therapist, gender is something, identity, gender identity is something that is very real. And we do have trans kids in our schools. They exist and they have a right yeah. to be acknowledged and respected and supported. Yeah, uh, to that point, uh, Alex, I, I think that's indisputable what Gina just said. There are trans kids, there are kids who are confused about their sexual identity in school and their classmates know it. Now, if you, are you saying that a textbook should not reflect that reality? No, a textbook should not reflect that reality because this is a health, human reproduction and disease education textbook. Our school district has more than sufficient resources currently that provide support for LGBTQ community and youth. I would say almost to a degree that is, that is discriminatory of the youth that is not LGBTQ+. So there's more than sufficient resources and support outside of official instruction within the classroom. It does not need to be addressed within official textbooks. It does not belong there. Alex, you have chosen, you have your parental choice was to take your kids out of public school, put them in private school. So why, um, you know, I so admire engaged parents in their children's education. That is like the A number one mark mm -hmm. of success by all accounts for a student of parents who are engaged. Why though take such effort and involvement to dispute what is in public schools? First and foremost, my three kids were in public school and the reason that we pulled them out of public school is because we identified the various problems that are prevalent in our district and across the nation, to be honest. So I am on a mission to uh, rectify that situation as best as I can at a local level with the organization that I represent. Second, second of all, I would say that even though my children are not in the school district at the moment, uh, they will be out in the community and in society with their counterparts that are being educated by our public school system. And if that education is not appropriate, is not factual, and is, uh, uh, includes ideology, that will reflect upon the society and the counterparts and the colleagues of my children and the children of many others. Yeah, I would simply say, Gina, in about 30 seconds, you want your children to be among peers who are well educated about domestic abuse, about sexually transmitted diseases, all the other things that are in this textbook and are problems for young people. That's correct. And, and, and I am just so pleased that our school board, my, my faith has been restored in them, that they're putting our children first and, and that they're uh, living up to the A rating that this district provides. So I, I'm proud that both of my children have been through this entire, uh, their, their entire school career has been in the public school system. My daughter's a sophomore at University of Florida and thriving. And I just see the amazing teachers that she's had. And, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Gina Venezuela, Weza, excuse me. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. Alex Serrano, we are interested in your group. We're gonna have you back at, in the future to talk about your uh, mission in Miami-Dade County politics. Appreciate you both. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, up next, Broward schools are asking for a property tax hike when the voters go to the polls August 23rd. The school district says they need the money because the state isn't giving them enough. That's next. We would have to cut back in other areas, and those other areas, quite candidly, would probably be some of the 
student activities that we do right now. It would mean everything to us, putting gas in our cars, food on our table for our own children and our own families. The Broward School District is in campaign mode this week, hoping to convince voters that a relatively small bump in property taxes is worth funding teachers and school security. Last April, Broward School Board voted to take it to the voters next month. The school board wants to hike the millage rate in Broward from $50 per $100,000 of assessed property value to $100 per $100,000. That would bring in about $222 million a year for the Broward School District, money they say they need to recruit, retain teachers, add school safety officers, provide mental health services. Leading the charge for that tax hike is the Broward School Superintendent, Dr. Vicki Cartwright, here right now with us via Zoom Live. Dr. Cartwright, great to have you with us again. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for having me on your show today. So let's begin with the most basic question. We sort of went through, you know, what you are asking for, but what is your argument to Broward taxpayers why they should vote for this proposed property tax hike? So I think it's very important that I'm sharing information related to uh, what we are asking, not trying to convince one way or the other, but just making sure people are informed. Yeah, you are um, prohibited by law from advocating, but not prohibited from making a factual presentation. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So what we are looking to do at this point in time is renew our or secure the next generation referendum. Um, so we currently have a referendum and it is set to expire uh, next summer. And that referendum currently provides um, air supplements for our teachers or, or our school-based people. Um, it also provides for our security personnel and it also provides for mental health. Um, if that does not get renewed, um, then at that point in time, all of those areas, all of the funding that we have for that would go away. So what's really important is for people to understand what is it for. So what we have done as well is there's been a change since the last time we went out for a referendum versus this time. And it's a legislative change. And it's now we, requires us to share the money with our charter schools, all of our charter schools. And so even if we went just for a renewal of the half mill, we would actually be generating generating less money at that point in time. So going out for a full mill actually puts us into a much better position to be a market competitive uh, because right now Palm Beach does have a full mill and Miami-Dade has three quarters of a mill. However, they are going to be going out to their voters and asking for a full mill as well. So and then in, in essence, what this is, is we are looking to use the full mill, 75% of it or more, we go towards supplements and stipends for our classroom-based individuals or people who are out at our schools every day. So this is going to be like your cafeteria workers, it could be your bus drivers, it could be our paraprofessionals, it can be our teachers. And it's really important um, when we're taking a look at that supplement, uh, because it does allow for them to have a livable wage. Um, we want our employees to live here in Broward County as well as work here in Broward County. And being the largest employer in Broward County, it does make a difference. Uh, in addition to that, we'll have up to 8% um, that is going to be for school safety personnel um, so that we can continue to make sure that we're providing that safe learning environment for all of our school sites. Um, and then up to 17% um, excuse me, I apologize about that. Actually, it's up to 17% for our school resource officers and safety staff, clarification there. Uh, and then the 8% up um, is for our central programs. And Dr. our central Dr. programs Dr. are gonna be in mental health. I, I know um, it probably would be very helpful for viewers to know that they can go on the Broward School District website and see all of the nitty gritty percentages. Right. But I think conceptually, I think it's really important to understand that the state state law and, and state law almost every session for the last few years mandates school security um, and allocates some funding for it, but probably not enough. So partially an unfunded mandate, especially for the larger school districts in South Florida. But what was really interesting to hear you say is that you are, you are I don't want to use the word threatening, I don't want to be too editorial about it, but you are threatening cutbacks on programs um, and possible student activities if this does not go through. And I'd like for you to sort of frame how possible and what the potential is for that. So what we have right now is we currently generate approximately $21 million with our current referendum that goes towards our school safety resources. 
and about $9 million that goes towards our mental health um, services. And you were correct. The legislatively, we're very grateful um, to our governor and to our legislators um, for the safe school allocations. Um, however, we every year we're going into our general budget in order to ensure that we have that safe school officer at every school site. Uh, so what ends up happening is that's about $30 million right there that we would have to find funding in order to continue to provide those services, the mental health resources and the safety school officers. Uh, so when we're doing that $30 million, we already have a very tight budget as it is right now. So it would require that we would have to do some cuts and would have to be somewhere in the budget that currently exists because we just simply can't roll back on having school per, uh, safety personnel out of, out of our sites. So when you're going backwards um, and you're rolling these things backwards out, where do you find the $30 million? Uh, so that's something that's very concerning. Yes, we would have to look at everything on the table, to be honest with you. We'd have to be looking at programs for our students. Um, we would also take a look at, we know that when we're looking at programs, on, if you don't have certain programs within your school, then that's also meaning that there's going to be people who may not have a job as well. So everything is on the table if we have to look at this. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, the $82 million that we currently generate for our our supplements for all of our school-based individuals, that would go away as well. And now um, some of our best and brightest, they could go to either district on, on either side of us and get a much better yeah, It's a competitive, competitive environment for teachers, for good staff people. We understand that. And a good education is expensive. It costs, costs a good deal of money. But on the subject of money, Dr. Cartwright, I don't need to tell you Inflation in South Florida is about 10 percent. The cost of food has skyrocketed. Rents are up. Mortgages are close to 6 percent, you know, 5 uh, percent for a 30 year uh, fixed rate mortgage. I mean, everything is costing more. And you've got people in Broward County who are on fixed incomes and they are saying, gee, I believe in schools, but I don't have another twenty five dollars, twenty six dollars per month which I think would be about the average, wouldn't it, uh, that the taxes would go up? So when we're taking a look at this, uh, the average rate, and, and thank you for bringing that up, um, it is an additional $13 more um, per month is what we're talking about over what they're already currently paying for the average home market value of around $478,000. So that's what we're talking about is about $13 more. Um, and for a condo, um, for an average condo market value of around 224000 approximately, um, then we're talking that it would be $7.50 more per month. That's what we're talking about. Um, and we do understand the concern that everything is, is more expensive. And quite frankly, again, that's why this is so important um, is because of those supplements for all of our eligible staff and out at our school sites themselves because it's more expensive for them as well. Yeah, Dr. Vicki Cartwright, we appreciate all that information and uh, you joining us today. And we'll certainly be watching what happens in the next few weeks. Thanks very we much. Appreciate it. Thank oh. you. And oh, if I may, please don't forget um, when people do go and vote on August 23rd, please flip over your ballot because it is at the back of back the, of the uh, ballot. Yeah, good, re good reminder. Okay. And as a matter <laughs> of fact, you. we're going to be talking about those ballots because the vote by mails are already in the mail, already landing. And we've gotten word of a possible ballot mix up in Broward County. And so for the straight info, we're going directly to the Broward election supervisor. Joe Scott joins us next. I opened it and I knew that it was the wrong candidate. So I right away said, okay, I need to call the supervisor of elections office. That is the former mayor of Cooper City, Debbie Eisinger, claiming that she was sent the wrong mail-in ballot for the upcoming primary on the left right there. The ballot she received shows Congressional District 20, but she says that's not her district. She says on the right is the sample ballot she printed out from the website showing what she says is her correct district, which is District 23. So let's find out what is going on here and who better to do that than the Broward Supervisor of Elections, Joe Scott. He joins us by Zoom. Joe, good morning. Great to see you. Hi. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Glenna. Thank you for the opportunity to come on and inform the public about, you know, what we can do to make sure that this problem is resolved. 
Okay, so right there, I guess you acknowledge that there is a problem, so that's a good step. Um, you've got this. You've got this super engaged voter, so she knew right away. A lot of people wouldn't even know to look. So she apparently received the wrong mail-in ballot with the wrong candidates on it. What happened? Right. So I want to start off by uh, making sure that everybody is aware that we this is our very first election after the redistricting process. So the census that took place in 2020 then led to redistricting, and there were a lot of changes that had to take place very, very quickly. We are very, very grateful for those vigilant voters who are taking a close look and notifying us if they see something. We really encourage everybody to say something. Uh, in this case, uh, this uh, voter is absolutely correct. Um, and there was a the redistricting process um, there was a bit of an overlap that affected a few hundred people where the redistricting took hold after the vote by mails were in process. And it was a um, it's something that we tried our best to anticipate. We tried our best to intercept those ballots that and a few of them got past us and got out there. And we have identified those people and we are working now to contact them and make sure that they get the correct ballot so that they're able to vote in the proper um, in the proper congressional election because for the people who are impacted for the most part that's the one yeah. um, that that was that may so be impacted what what you're saying Joe is just just that that the mistake only involved the congressional election for voters like Debbie Eisinger? no so that's not so it has to do with the precinct so Many of the races that are on that ballot are countywide. So anything that's countywide would not be impacted. Right. So say the governor, the you know the the state, uh, the senator, the um, the school board, the judges, the school board. Um, Think, things question, with no particular districts. Right. right. Yeah. Right. So if there, yeah, so if there's not a district divide within Broward County, it wouldn't impact um, the the particular problem that occurred. Would not have happened. Uh, only happened in situations where the, the race would have been different. So in this case, I, I want to be very careful and not give out anybody's private addresses, but I will say that the former mayor of Cooper City lives in Fort Lauderdale. We'll just say she lives in Fort Lauderdale. She lives in a district probably with, you know, a, a congressional district is what, 700,000 and some odd voters. Are you right. confident that this is the only precinct or only district or or whatever standard you reach. Is this the only place where this has happened? Or do you now have to go back to nah. every single precinct to make sure that the ballots are right? No, so yeah, so just to be clear, it, it actually does not impact an entire precinct. And that's really something uh, that we're very thankful for. Because when we're dealing with 1.2 million voters in 31 different cities, anything that might go wrong tends to impact thousands of people. That's not the case here. In this case, what it actually impacted were individual streets. So the person that you spoke to, her street uh, was impacted. So everybody who lives on that particular street, and there are several other streets in Broward County that had the exact same problem at the exact same time, and we are aware of every single one. So we know exactly who is impacted and we are working hard to contact each of those voters. Yeah. And we're actually planning an operation that includes us setting up shop on those streets that were affected and swapping. We need to do a one for one swap the ballot that you received in the mail with the corrected ballot. And that's something that's going to happen over the next few days. All right. So in the next few days, you can count on local 10 news being out there on the street watching uh, from a respectful distance. We won't be in your face, uh, but we want to see uh, the people get the correct ballot, and I know you do too. Absolutely, and I appreciate you all giving me an opportunity to come on and let everybody know what's happening and what we're doing about it. Wait, don't go yet. I'm not done with you yet. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> so, so here's, I, I'm just going to throw out there, I mean, we talk a lot, right? And, and I know um, I just want to throw out there, I think we're very confident that this elections department is on top of things and working very hard to be so. And redistricting has really thrown all elections departments into sort of a fray to get everything right. So that said, we are in, as you know, a very suspicious climate politically. And do you feel like now you need to do something 
to sort of preemptively strike out against anyone who's going to look for claims of fraud or mismanagement. Um, I don't want to be the one to plant that. I think I'm very confident to say that that's already sort of out there. Um, and I want you as the head yes. of Broward Elections to address that, if you would. I would. So, you know, the thing I'm most worried about is that people will use this to attack the vote by mail system. But what I'll say is that this, again, this happens every 10 years. We go through redistricting. And when you consider something that happens once in a decade, I mean, we will do everything that we can to try to be on top of every possible thing that could go wrong. What I'm really thankful for here is that we have vote by mail because vote by mail is the reason that we identified this before early voting. Otherwise, we may not have known this problem until people were voting in person. And it would have been so much more difficult for us to figure out what went wrong, put a fix in place on a day that people are voting in person because of vote by mail. And because we have a little bit of lead time, we're able to, you know, identify the root cause of the issue and then resolve that and make sure that it is completely that everything is good to go before people start to vote in person. Yeah. So I'm really thankful that we have vote by mail and I don't want people to use this as an attack on vote by mail. Understood. And Joe Scott, supervisor of Broward Elections, I want everyone to know that I called you this morning and pop, you were there to answer and be transparent. And for that, we yeah. are very grateful. We, we certainly are. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael and Glenda for having me on. All right. Up next, the race for Miami-Dade Commission in District 12. It's a doozy. And one of the candidates joins us next. Here are the candidates for the Miami-Dade County Commission in District 12, that is Western Miami-Dade. Juan Carlos Bermudez, JC to his friends, and Sofia Lacayo. In all, six Miami-Dade County Commission seats are going to change this election year because of term limits. Five of those seats have no incumbent. Pepe Diaz is term limited in District 12, and the candidates to succeed him are J.C. Bermudez, Durrell's current mayor, and Ms. Lacayo, former Sweetwater commissioner who was forced to resign after she pled guilty to perjury. So we wanted to ask her about that lie and how she spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of paycheck protection money and also about her positions on county issues. We did try for days to contact her to be with us today, but no response. And so the time goes to Doral Mayor and candidate for commission, Juan Carlos J.C. Bermudez, joining us via Zoom. Great to see you, Mayor. Mayor Bermudez, great to see you. Yeah, good to see both of you, uh, Glenna. Uh, and, and also, Mike, uh, you know, uh, great to be with you this morning and with the uh, viewers. Yeah. Well, let's begin with the basic question. What is the theme of your campaign? Why are you the best candidate in District 12? I think, you know, uh, it, very importantly, it's experience, number one, transparency and ethics. Uh, having started the city from scratch and dealing, as both of you know, with many issues that concern the county and the state, uh, beginning with... Uh, mitigation, which we successfully were able to get rid of and help Doral, Miami Lakes, and Palmetto Bay. Um, I think the experience of, of knowing how to work with uh, the county commission, how to work with the state and the federal level goes a long way. Uh, and when you compare uh, the trajectory that I've had over the years with my opponent, I think the answer is clear. And I, that's the reason why I humbly am asking the voters to vote for me for District 12. All right, so, you know, we do things pretty quickly here in television, so let's get a couple of issues in before <laughs> before we run out of time. Um, just very recently, the mayor of Miami-Dade put out her budget. There's a 1% tax cut because property values are going up. She's bringing the millage down 1%, saving $14 a year for homesteaded people. Um, some of the commissioners right now wanted it to be an even steeper cut, 3 or 4% uh, lower taxes. What would your take be as a commissioner on that? I probably would want a steeper cut. The uh, times are very difficult now uh, all across the county, so I do believe that there should be a um, you know a steeper cut than just the 1%. But one of the problems, Glenna, that exists over the years at the county is a lack of clarity on, on the programs and the budgeting and the accountability. One of the things I would like to bring to the county is something that we did at a much smaller scale here in Doral, which is really measuring and having metrics uh, not only for programs but the efficiency and the effectiveness of 
different departments. And I think right now at Miami-Dade County, there's too much, uh, the departments are in silos. And when you're in silos, you can never really put together the best plan you can across the board. Do you have and one in begins, particular, one or two in particular you're thinking can be gone? Well, I don't know if it, the departments would be gone, but I'll give you an example. You know, let's take something as simple as the, you know, the, the half penny sales tax, which uh, the residents voted for. Moving some of these dollars across to other parts of the budget, first of all, is not is being intellectually honest to the voters. But number two, we have a lot of transportation and transit issues, and that's what those dollars should go for. So I think we need to have much more accountability also when we talk about uh, some of these departments and we talk about being effective and efficient. And I don't say that necessarily to eliminate departments or anything of, of that uh, ty type. Uh, it's more along the lines of we need to figure out what is effective and what isn't effective. And, and I think we need to do that from A to Z. Yeah. Uh, JC, uh, you know, we all know that affordable and workplace housing in Miami-Dade County, all of South Florida, is a huge issue. Uh, Mayor Daniela Levine Cava has a plan to get 18,000 units, you know, by next year online and available. Uh, do you support her efforts? Well, I definitely support our efforts to try to get affordable housing, workforce housing online. I think we have to be realistic, though, Mike, because one of the things that we need to understand as the policymakers is that these decisions that are taken are not easily executed if, if there's not a process already set up to do this effectively and efficiently. I do agree with the mayor, and I was there at her original summit, uh, that this is something that's critical. It needs to be tackled, and it needs to be tackled uh, relatively quickly because we are pricing out. Right. Uh, the ability of many, not only just young people, but many people to be able to live in Miami-Dade County and work in Miami-Dade County. And, and that has to be, uh, it's almost at a crisis level, I would tell you. You know, you think of Doral, besides traffic, you think of industry <laughs> and you, <laughs> you, true, you think of uh, business. Um, you know, there's going to be a question about moving the urban development boundary for a big logistics mm -hmm. center. Um, mayor already says she's going to veto it. It's it's coming back in September. You won't be there if you do win this election. But would you would you allow the UDB to be moved? Look, I don't at that particular project. I'm not familiar enough. I read a little bit and I've heard some of the things that have been reported. But my opinion on the UDB is that the UDB wasn't necessarily set as a permanent line, number one. But what I do not understand, and I've shared this with some of the planners at the county, some that used to work in Doral and were my planners in Doral, I believe we need to look at a holistic plan when it comes to the urban development boundary. To do this piecemeal, project by project, is not good for anyone. It's not good for those who believe that it shouldn't be moved. It's not good for those who believe it should be moved. JC, very bring, diplomatic uh, right there. Boy, I, I you, <laughs> no. You know, we're, we, we apologize. We're out of time, but we will follow this race in District 12 and wish you luck. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Thank you I'm always available. Thank you very much. Stay All tuned. Right. We'll be right back. What an hour. As always, we thank you for being here with us. We have a QR code right there on the screen. If you want to watch more, just copy that and it'll take you right to This Week in South Florida's page. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved, have a great Sunday.